Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Check In by Travel Market Report. My guest for this episode is Michelle Sutter, the Vice President of North American Sales at Holland America Line. Michelle is another one of these outstanding industry personalities that travel just seems not only able to attract constantly, but also build. Michelle's another industry lifer. She got her start working on board a cruise ship, a position she's served in for more than three years, and something we talk about during this episode. I felt very fortunate to be able to talk to Michelle, not only about that experience, but about some of her philosophies and her wisdoms, a lot of which I think is incredibly relevant for today's travel advisor. We talk about being generous. We talk about being able to recognize when things are out of your hands and when to let go of control, however reluctant you may be. We talk about the concept of time as a gift and realizing that there's a finite resource that we take for granted sometimes in our lives. And it's important for your own sake and for the sake of the industry to, to not do that as much as possible. It's a fairly short conversation, but one that I really did enjoy and one that I'm very happy to share with you all today. So without further ado, let's check in with Michelle. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Michelle. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. How's how's everything going? Everything is going well. I so you're based in Vancouver, right? Correct. All right. And uh, have you been in Vancouver a long time? Yes, I grew up in Vancouver, so okay. I, I've lived here uh, most of my life. So one thing I want to ask you about because I heard you mention it in your stick with it talk is uh, you mentioned ketchup potato chips and is a <laughs> thing in Canada. And I, I've had a like a visible reaction because I we 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 are in Toronto a lot. We're in Vancouver a bunch too, um, and it's just seeing those on like the store shelves always struck me as so incredibly weird. But you mentioned <laughs> it in your talk, and it seemed it seemed like something. It seems like a thing in Canada, right? Uh, well, it it's definitely a thing in my household, okay. and and I have learned that um, having shared my obsession with ketchup chips with others that it seems to be a Canadian thing because as I travel in other parts of the world I've never seen ketchup chips elsewhere so yes it is a Canadian thing and that is my guilty pleasure ketchup okay. chips and during COVID as I shared in my stick with it speech I, I think I um, kept Lay's and old Dutch potato chip companies in business as I um, definitely ate my weight in ketchup chips. Yeah, uh, I just couldn't. I remember seeing them. I might have been at a gas station. I think I went in to get a cup of coffee in Toronto and I saw them on the shelf and it was just I thought someone was playing a joke on me at first. But like <laughs> the more the more and more I talk to people who are from Canada, it's it doesn't seem like a weird thing at all, according to them. <laughs> that that is true that is true and i've seen some interesting potato chip flavors in other parts of the world that seems strange to me so i guess yeah. it's just a, another another example of how we're all different but um unique in our own ways yeah exactly uh yeah so it's it's nice it's nice to sort of sh- i guess it's nice to share those kind of experiences when you're traveling and i'm sure everyone has a ton of them on their list is is the different kind of cuisines you get when you do uh go to different regions of the world and things like that absolutely uh, uh, that's i think one of the beauties of travel is um if not the the highlight of travel are those unique experiences and learnings that you have when you're in other places in the world that you wouldn't otherwise experience if you stayed in the four corners of your home or your hometown city. I I, I know you have a, a, a long career in the travel industry and I know you have an interesting, you had an interesting start getting into travel and I know it was with the cruise company and I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about that, a little bit about how you sort of stepped foot into the travel industry. Sure. You know, I I graduated from university and I was um, the summer after I graduated ready, getting ready to go um, work in Switzerland in a boarding school. A few weeks before I was leaving or planning to leave, I, I received an interview request for a role that from a cruise line. And so what I didn't realize was months earlier, I when I had responded to a classifieds ad in the newspaper, yes, I'm dating myself, yeah. which only said, if you speak languages and you love to travel, apply here, that it was for a cruise line. 
And so I went to that interview and was offered the position to go work on board uh, a few weeks thereafter. So I, I went for a walk with a, a close friend of mine and I was, I was in a dilemma because I'd already accepted this other role in, in Switzerland, but now I was being offered this one. And she said to me, so Michelle, what would you rather do? Wake up at five in the morning every day looking after kids in a boarding school or sail the world with people from all over the world? And when she positioned it that way, it was an easy decision. So that's how I started my career in the cruise industry. And I, I went to go work shipboard, which I did for just over three and a half years. So um, what was what was the plan prior to you mentioned the boarding school? Was your plan to be an educator was to sort of build a career in education? So I'm half Swiss. And so we as uh, Swiss nationals in Canada have access to working opportunities in Switzerland. And what I really wanted to do is ultimately go to uh, hotel management school in Switzerland. Oh, wow. And so I thought this was a great opportunity to get to Switzerland, earn some money, visit the, the home country that I hadn't spent a lot of time in previously. And, and this was a, a vehicle to do that. So it was, it would have, I, I, let's just say that perhaps my path would have ended up in travel eventually had I, had I continued to go, but I have no regrets whatsoever. And in fact, I would say of all of my life experiences to date, the most valuable life experience I've had was working on board ships. So you, you said it was three and a half years, right? Was that, mm -hmm. that was the initial tenure. So what was it like? What was sort of the change like going from living, I mean, living on land to, to to moving your life to a cruise ship for three and a half or so years? You know, it was so different for so many different wonderful reasons. One is that I was working with people from over like 60, I think it was like 67 different nations. In, in that context, it was such a learning experience and such a rich opportunity to live, work, and socialize daily with people from all over the world. And while we're traveling all over the world. So every day was a different experience. In your and I every day today, you know, we have our you know go-to restaurants and you know our the concerts we may go to and visit our friends but in the life of working on ships you're doing that while traveling the world so you have these unique experiences that happen every day and i learned so much not only about the people that i worked with and basically became my family but also of different cultures and it opened my eyes to how people live in other countries um, and also those who, who I worked with who came from other countries that perhaps didn't have the same upbringing that I did and having compassion and empathy for some of the struggles that others had that I didn't understand before having worked on ships. So it really opened my mind and my heart to the world and to, to others and ignited my my passion for travel and I'm I'm still to this very day so profoundly grateful that I had that experience because it's it definitely shaped um the person that I am today and and how I view the world and my unwavering commitment to wanting to share that same gift with others in terms of whether it's going on a cruise or you know, just getting out and traveling is to learn about people and cultures around the world. Yeah, there does there does seem to be something that, like you mentioned, uh, every time I'm on a cruise ship, the crew members seem to just have an incredible amount of camaraderie with each other. And they're also always incredibly kind and incredibly thoughtful mm -hmm. when dealing with passengers. And I'm sure that's something that like Holland America and other cruise lines train their crew to do. But it does seem that it comes with it sort of comes with that position when you're dealing with this many people, when you're dealing with this many different cultures, different different languages. Um, it does seem like you have to sort of adapt to be able to be extremely welcoming. Yes, you're right. Well, as you mentioned, the camaraderie, we all, when we're working on ships, are at sea, depending on our positions, anywhere from four to nine months, at least when I worked on ships, um, at a time without seeing our friends and family back home. So essentially, our peers and our colleagues become our family, right? And we're traveling together, living together. And, and the occasions of the year that we normally would get together with family, we, we 
when you work on ships, you don't have that luxury. So your onboard peers and colleagues become your family. And so that definitely contributes to that sense of camaraderie. And yes, when I worked on ships and, 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 and to this date, we're all trained to ensure that the guest experience is the best experience they can have and putting them first. And it just becomes second nature. In fact, you know, I haven't worked on ships in 22 years. When I go on a cruise now, even on a paid or like on a paid cruise on vacation, I still instinctively do not get in the elevator. I do not oh, like, really? yeah, I do not get in line in front of others. I try and get out of my cabin early in the morning because I know the cabin attendant is waiting to clean it. So it's just, it becomes ingrained in you because of how we were trained when we worked on ships is to like the guest always comes first. Okay. And then your, your role, do you remember your early roles? Uh, I, I know you, you, you are bilingual or trilingual, right? And that sort of played into the role you were serving on there on your early career. Yes. So I started, my very first um, position was as an assistant purser. And that then was what the role that we would call the, the, the individuals who work at the front desk. Oh. And so basically it's, it's the customer service uh, desk of the ship, if you will. I did that for six months and that was definitely an interesting role. The different types of things that people um, would come, what ended up to, in all honesty, a lot of it were, were a lot of the people we connected with in that function were sharing challenges and issues they were experiencing. Um, I still remember two incidents that, um, somebody getting upset with us because um, their their stamps, their American stamps would not work in Jamaica and us having to try and explain that and asking when the midnight buffet would be oh, and God. all of those fun questions. So that was interesting. But from there, I went on and became the international ambassador, which was a fancy title for translator. Essentially, I was the, the representative there to assist the Spanish and French speaking guests. Um, I could get by in a little bit of Italian if I tried really hard as well. And so that was a really interesting uh, role because all I did all day was speak in Spanish and French. So I loved okay. that opportunity to focus on my languages. And then my last role before I left ships was I was one of the first future cruise consultants at that time. And I was selling cruises on board when we were still using very antiquated systems and um, it wasn't even a full-time position then. So I was doing it as a side job while I was also the translator on board. That's interesting though, because I, I know there's so many positions, there's so many people in positions like yours at other cruise lines who have sort of started on board ships and built their careers along the way. And I think it's a lot of times people sort of forget about that when they're when they see executives like you is that uh, there was a long road to get here. And, and a lot of people sort of had to have that first hand experience of dealing with customers. And you you had that first hand experience of actually selling cruises to customers too. I did. And at that time, I could tell you the square footage of any single <laughs> cabin on any ship, all the categories, I, I had them all memorized. And I actually really, my last cruise that I worked was the new, before I, I left ships, was the New Year's Eve 1999 cruise. Oh, wow. And that was the best cruise to sell cruises on because at that time the the cruise that they were on the new year's eve celebration cruise millennial cruise was very expensive and so everyone who was sailing on board had very big budgets for their future cruise and i had the longest line i'd had in <sighs> that position and they never asked once how much the cruise was going to be they just all came to the desk saying book me the royal suite book me the royal suite book me the royal suite i sold more cruises on that cruise and I did in like the four cruises combined prior to that. So it, it was a, it was a fun experience for sure. Spending my last cruise working shipboard on that milestone um, new year's Eve celebration. Yeah, that, that is incredible. I guess you were going, if you were going to go, if you were leaving a position, at least you were leaving it uh, with the best, with the best week you've had too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. It was, it was fun for sure. Um, so I wanted to ask you, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the call, I, I watched a couple of your talks and in particular your Stick With It talk, which which I think was 2021. Is that right? Yeah. So um, the Stick With It talk that you saw was actually on board the Rotterdam 
which was in on March 10th of this year, 2022. But I started the talk. Um, I did a few a few presentations, which started in 2021. But the one you saw, I, I delivered on board the Rotterdam for our Attitude of Gratitude Trade Appreciation Cruise on March 10th. Okay, so uh, I wanted to ask you about a couple of things uh, I, I I was able to learn uh, from the talk. And one of them was this Travel Advisor Book Club that you started during the pandemic. I guess, where did that idea come from? Because I know there was there was a lot of idle time for a lot of people during the pandemic, particularly in travel and hospitality. And uh, it seems like just a, a great way to keep people engaged. And I know we mentioned camaraderie, but it also seems like a way to keep relationships and keep people almost sane, especially during those early few months. Yes, that that is that is so true. At the beginning of the pandemic, one of the my focuses I was that I was very intentional about is how I was going to use this gift of time to not sit idle and and for lack of a better kind of um, term is not drive myself crazy with kind of the the isolation and what have you. And so one of my passions is reading. And I had already previously started what we call internally a learning circle with my team members. And so with a conversation with one of my colleagues, Tara Schreiner, we talked about perhaps scaling that to the travel advisor community. At the time, this was in, I think, July of 2020. I remember talking with Tara about, you know, what, what our expectations and vision was for the MS Masterminds Travel Advisor Book Club. And I remember telling Tara, well, if we can get at least 25 people to join, then, you know, we can have some good discussions and that will, you know, be fruitful and, and add value. And we started in July of 2020 and we, I think we exceeded that, or we, sorry, I, we met that 25 threshold or, or kind of benchmark. And now two years later, we have almost 700 members. Oh We've God. read nine books and counting and really what happened organically and what I think has been the biggest gift of this Travel Advisor Book Club has been the community that it has developed and evolved into being. The, the members of this Travel Advisor Book Club are so engaged and connected not only within with myself and in the book club, but also with themselves, even though some of them could be direct competitors. If you see the conversations and the discussions and the sharings and learnings that people share within the discussions and within the Facebook group, it's really quite inspirational. So it, it really has been such a gift. And for those who aren't already part of the MS Masterminds Travel Advisor Book Club. I really encourage you to join us. You can find us on Facebook under MS Masterminds. And you don't always have to have read the book to, to participate because I facilitate these conversations for those who can just, so that they're of value to those who haven't read the book as well. Oh, so what, so what kind of books are usually on the, on the reading list? Mm, okay, so we have read, let's see if I can remember all, them all off the top of my head. And no, I'm not going to challenge myself to put them in order, but we've read organized and they're all nonfiction, personal and professional development books. So we've read Organize Tomorrow Today, Everybody Matters, The Happiness Advantage, Crucial Conversations, Mindset, Start With Why, Find Your Why, Lynchpin, and the most powerful you. And then I guess that you're, you have a thesis behind these choices. Uh, like I'm, I'm guessing these all seem to be books that are going to help people build their business or build relationships, things like that. Yeah. So I, I always select books that I have already read so that I have insight into the value that they can add to the travel advisor community. With the exception of one book, which was The Most Powerful You by Kathy Caprino, which was only relevant for women in this case, because it was it is a book that focuses on the seven most common power gaps that women experience in the workplace. Every other book, aside from that one, could be shared or applicable to anyone who reads it. Okay. And all of these books had a, an, a positive impact on me personally and professionally and my team members. And so from my perspective, it was it, the selections are made with the intention of adding value for the travel advisor. And, and many of them in, in some cases can 
actually add value personally just as much as professionally as well. Um, it's interesting. You used, uh, when you were speaking, you you spoke about the gift of time. And I, I never, I, I, that's just an interesting way to think about time uh, as a gift. And I think it's, it's something I sort of picked up on when I, when I was listening to your stick with it talk. Um, you're very much aware that the time is a, a resource, like an unrenewable, a very valuable resource. Yes. And, and the thing is, is that one of the learnings I had during the pandemic was that many of us, including me at many times, we were wishing the time to pass to get to back to like, quote unquote, normal, right? But that was very short lived in terms of like, we all were, at least myself, I'll say, being disappointed because the, the goalposts kept moving, right? It's only going to be a few weeks. Okay, yeah. a few months. Oh, now we're a few years. And that was hard to deal with those goalposts moving, the disappointment w- that would come with each of those setbacks. So early on, I was very intentional about looking at this through the lens of being grateful for the gift of time. And what are the things that I can do right now that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to do with not having this time? And so you know, we talked about the MS Masterminds Travel Advisor Book Club. I also um, completed a executive leadership coaching program during that time. And I, I invested my time in many different ways and learned so many things. And one of my favorite quotes during this time that kind of was the guiding light or North Star for me was a Gandhi quote that says, live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live forever. And so that that's kind of how I try to manage through the pandemic and look at time is, is what can I do to um, maximize the, this time that we have? Yeah, and I, and I guess that that plays into uh, a little bit of, of something else I've I've heard you speak about, and that's sort of this your sort you called it the circle of control, mm-hmm. um, and that seemed incredibly relevant to me not not just for for for, for people in the industry for basically anyone alive, especially after the past few years, because the the list of things you could not control that had a significant impact on your day to day life just seemed to be growing every day and you spoke a little bit about understanding that things are going to be out of your control uh they're going to impact your life but you just have to sort of come to this understanding that there's nothing you can do about it right because if if the pandemic didn't teach us anything the one thing it taught us is that we had to accept that there was so much outside of our control, right? Whether that was, you know, the availability of toilet paper at the yeah. outset of, of the pandemic or, you know, when our ships would get back in the water. Yeah. There was so much outside of our control. And many of us, including myself, initially, I was allowing myself to get caught up with getting stressed or getting anxious about the things that were outside of our control. And so one of the exercises that I I shared or practices that I shared and stick with it is the circle of control. And um, those who know me know that I have a little bit of an unnatural obsession with sticky notes. So it is a, it is a sticky note exercise, but essentially I, I challenged people and, and whether it was during the pandemic or today, I would still challenge you to do the same thing is write one thing per sticky note of all the things that bring you stress and may um, be distractors or disruptors in your day to day, and then put them all on a wall and then write all the things that, you know, that you do in your day to day that may bring you joy or may make you feel productive and then put them all on a wall and then look at all of those things. And then place the things that are outside of your control in a circle on the outside of a circle and the things that are within your control on the inside of the circle. And the key is, is to focus your energy on those things that are inside of the circle that are within your control, accepting that you cannot control the things on the outside of the circle. Having that visual reminder and having that circle of control, whether you put that, you know, on the wall in front of your desk or on the mirror and your bathroom every morning to look at is a great reminder to stay focused on what you can control um, because it is a um, it is it is it can be very stressful when we're we're focused on on what we can't control. 
I think you put it, you put it very easy. It seems very easy when you say it, but I imagine it was still incredible, especially you mentioned waiting for ships get, to get it back in the water. Um, I think a lot of advisors had the same sort of anxiety about that, that a lot of the cruise, cruise industry people had because they were very much wanting to get their clients back on board. But that must have been an incredibly difficult thing to accept is that uh, this is sort of our business, but there's we, we really don't have a ton of control over when we're actually going to be able to operate again. You're right. And so using that example, what I would say is this, I can't control when our ships will be back in the water. But what I can control is how I can prepare the travel advisor community for when they do get in the water with how we equip them with resources, assets, training, how we support their learning and development so that when the ships are back in the water, our travel partners feel equipped, ready, supported, and prepared for when they're back in the water. So it's not that I'm shifting my energy away from that stressor, but I'm shifting my energy into the things that I can control that can impact that in the long run. And I imagine that is powerful advice for advisors because there there are a long list of things that impact their business that they very much have no control over. I know there's a lot of like consumer media can really change things for them very, very quickly. Um, everyone experienced over the past couple of years uh, have border border rules and, and, and COVID measures can change things like that. So I imagine travel advisors taking heed of your advice are able to sort of have an easier time getting through their 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 daily grind. I hope so. That's the intention. Um, so I just have a couple more questions for you, and I, I don't want to take up your whole afternoon. Um, but I know the last point I want to ask about from, from your stick with this talk is just focusing generosity on clients. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about uh, what that means and, and why you think that's sort of powerful advice for, for travel advisors. Those, those travel advisors who... Um, have heard stick with it or been connected with us are familiar with you know my passion and the team's passion around added atti our attitude of gratitude and so in stick with it what i speak about and and what i i say in my everyday is you know how can i be of service to you as a travel advisor or how can i add value in your everyday on the flip side, as a travel advisor, I, I encourage you to think about the same thing. How can you be in service to your clients or how can you add value? What, what distinguishes you as a travel advisor from every other travel advisor that your client would potentially interact with is how you add value in those special ways that are intangible or not like that the actual transaction itself of giving them what they need and what they ask for is one thing but if you can anticipate their needs and see what they want before they even know they want it or it's sending a note of gratitude or making a phone call to say hello and just to check in without any other agenda that's what's going to fortify the partnerships and the relationships with your clients is that that being in service mindset and, and focusing your generosity on them in terms of authentically caring and demonstrating that authentic care for them. I, I mean, that's always sort of been the the question with, with a lot of consumers. And I think that's gone away the past few years, but it, I'm, I'm sure it still remains with some of them is that they always, uh, the ones who are not familiar with the travel trade or, or what travel advisors can do, I'm sure ask themselves, why wouldn't I book online? Why wouldn't I book direct as opposed to using a travel advisor. And I guess what you're what, what you're mentioning now is that those relationships will sort of go further than a transaction. Yes. And I would argue that right now, the relationship that a, a client has with their travel advisor is so much more valuable today than it ever has been because of all of the different restrictions and protocols and nuances that um, clients need to be aware of. It's, it's a full-time job as it is, <laughs> as everyone knows, just to keep track of it all. And so there is so much value, so much added value, I should say, that the travel advisor provides to the clients. And I've heard so many heartwarming stories over the last six months to a year of clients who actually turned around 
that generosity back to their travel partners who perhaps hadn't even gone on a cruise but sent them like a hundred dollar check just to say hey i know you probably oh, haven't wow. been you know getting a lot of business right now and i was thinking about you or you know calling to just say thank you and so what you put out in the world comes back and is reflected towards you so i i i encourage you to think about that and how you can be thoughtful in how you connect with your clients beyond the transaction um so i know we spoke about covid a lot in the past uh half an hour or so and i'm i'm sort of trying to shift a lot of my conversations sort of the future and i know covid's not gone away yet but I'm just curious on your end of things. I mean, do you are do you see any big challenges ahead for whether it's for 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 you or for the cruise industry in general, the travel trade um, that are going to sort of become the main topic of conversation over the next few years? Um, my perspective is that the biggest challenge that we all have right now as an industry is talent okay. and a lot has changed in the workplace in the last two years. And one of the biggest changes we've seen is expectations um, that the, the talent force has. And so companies will need to be flexible and pivot from where they were pre-pandemic to address the needs of, of the, the talent. And so staffing issues, I think, will be a challenge for companies who aren't willing to pivot and and make the necessary changes to address those needs. And I think one of the biggest um, opportunities that organizations have right now is to make the culture work that they do within their organizations a top priority because from my perspective, culture, it will be culture and talent will be the strategic differentiators for organizations in, in, in the years to come. Yeah, that is, that is good. I mean, I've heard that from other people and a number of specific roles. I know a lot of the industry is struggling with, like I, I spoke to a number of people who've mentioned corporate agents, agents who are able to sort of work within a GDS or, or within Sabre or something like that are, are, are going to be needed now more than ever too. But it's interesting to hear from your perspective too, talent. Talent is still going to drive a lot of these conversations. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, Michelle, I want to thank you for your time. I know I know how busy everyone in the industry is nowadays, and uh, I really appreciate you sort of meeting with me today and uh, and all your candor and uh, color today too. Thank you for this opportunity. I am always grateful to talk about the things that that I'm passionate about and bring me joy. So I appreciate you making the time to connect with me and to to share the stories uh, with others. All right, and I hope you feel I hope you feel better too, and uh, I'm hoping to see you in person uh, someday, someday over the next few months as well. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much. All right, bye bye. Take care.